Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Stanford CS 24W course. Um, today, I will be your guest instructor uh, on behalf of Yuri. My name is Jiaxuan, and you might find more information on myself on the website. I also was one of the head TA in the previous author, uh, offering, and so I'm relatively familiar with the course. Um, today, I'll be very excited to give the topic of graph neural network to you all um, in this lecture. So let's give a quick uh, recap of what I learned in the previous lecture. So the key concept we learned is node embedding. Our intuition is that we want to encode nodes in the network into low dimensional vector space. In particular, we want to learn a function that takes an input graph and embed that into low dimensional node embedding space. Here we project into two dimensions. And the key problem of machine learning on graph is how do we define this function f? So here's a recap of uh, how to encode a node. We have, um, uh, the, the goal is to define a similarity function um, that can uh, represent the similarity in the network and we want to approximate in the embedding space. And we really need to define two things. The first is the similarity function, represent how two nodes are close together in the network. Another thing is the encoder function that basically tells us how to map the node in the graph into the uh, embedding space. And there are two uh, key components here. Uh, we have encoder that map the node into embedding and decoder that de define this similarity function. So uh, the encoder function will take the node um, as input and generate embedding in the d-dimensional space. And similarity function will specify the relationship in the network and also express in the loss function as a decoder. And how do we define the similarity? Uh, last lecture, we talked about uh, random walk-based similarity function. For example, suppose two nodes, they co-occur in a short random walk, then we think uh, these two nodes are similar. So that's one way to define similarity, and we can also come up with other way to define similarity. And how about encoding? We have seen one of the uh, simplest way to uh, encode a node, that is through a shallow encoder or embedding lookup. So in this uh, shallow encoder, we have embedding matrix, and one column of the embedding matrix it represents one node, and the dimension of the embedding matrix represents the size of the node, uh, of the node embedding. And we, we talk about the uh, embedding lookup, which means that uh, we'll, uh, to, to represent the node, we'll pick one column in the embedding matrix and get that vector as the node representation. So this is the shallow encoder idea. So what are the issues of this shallow encoder? Well, uh, we list uh, three key limitations. The first is that um, this way of encoding nodes is not really scalable because we assign one learnable uh, vector for each node. So in total, there will be uh, to the order of uh, v uh, times d, this large number of uh, parameters. And it wouldn't work for a real world large graph, say it has um, billions of nodes. And another limitation is that this approach is in, uh, transdactic, uh, transdu transductive, uh, which means that uh, the encoder can only apply to the nodes that have seen during training time. So suppose we have this embedding matrix, but there's a new node that comes. We do, uh, we do not know how to encode that new node that, because it's not even in the embedding matrix. And lastly, this approach does not incorporate uh, node attributes. So in real world graph, the attributes on nodes are usually very valuable. For example, uh, in protein interaction graphs, we have a lot of protein properties uh, that can be associated with a given node. So without that uh, attributes, uh, we wouldn't be able to meaningfully learn from the network. But this kind of encoding uh, lookup, embedding lookup, we wouldn't be able to utilize such valuable attributes. So these are the limitations uh, for shadow encoder. And that's why today we want to dive deeper into how we can design more expressive, more powerful encoders. And our idea is to use deep graph encoder. And the idea is that rather than using a simple uh, embedding lookup, we will uh, uh, define multiple layers of uh, neural network transformations and use that deep neural network to encode uh, a node in the graph. And note that um, these deep encoders can be combined with the node similarity function that we have just introduced. For example, we can also define some sort of uh, random walk-based similarity function even for the deep encoder that we will later introduce today. 
So here is our plan, the pipeline of how to encode a, a deep graph uh, encoder. So our input will be a complex network. We will pass it through uh, several uh, graph convolutional layers. Um, between these layers, we can inject, uh, for example, activation functions and then some uh, regularization layers. Um, and after computing uh, this uh, through this uh, deep encoder, we will get uh, output. The output could be uh, node embeddings, which we most commonly seen, but we can also uh, generate, say, embeddings for subgraph and even embedding for entire graphs. So these are the, some options that we can use to uh, generate uh, through this deep graph encoder. So suppose we have this encoder, what we can do? Well, we can define many exciting tasks on graphs, and here at least four different levels. On the node level, we can use this idea to encode uh, different nodes and make node classification. Uh, for example, suppose we have a, a drug-protein interaction network, and then we can predict whether this drug uh, is toxic or not, or whether it can be used to uh, uh, treat a given disease. Uh, we can also define link prediction on network, and link prediction can be quite useful for, say, recommender systems, where we can define an interaction network between users and items, and we can predict whether a user will buy a certain item. And we can also define community detection on our network, and this can be useful, say, for financial networks, where we can have a cluster of, uh, of fraudsters, and they may have some uh, fishy transactions between each other, and our goal is to detect those kind of anomaly clusters in the network. And finally, we can define a network similarity task. In that case, it will be a graph level task or a graph level prediction. For example, we can uh, use this idea to encode different uh, drug molecules. So here we treat a molecule as a network and we want to classify uh, different types of molecules. So th this is just a, like a glimpse of different ways you can um, define machine learning tasks on graphs. Okay, so, so far we have motivated you that why we want to use um, deep uh, encoders to encode graph. And we'll start by uh, just taking a very brief uh, introduction of basics of deep learning. Um, and a lot of the course materials are also posted online. Uh, in this lecture, we wouldn't uh, cover all of them. So, because uh, we assume that most of you are, already have some idea of deep learning. Uh, but you, if you feel not like a very confident of some of the materials, please take a look on the website. And also we have this recitation and also, uh, office hours, so uh, you can also ask TAs about specific questions about um, uh, deep learning basics. So here I will just uh, summarize some of the key ideas that we probably want to uh, use in today's lecture. So our idea is to formulate machine learning as an optimization problem. This optimization problem has an input x, and the goal is to predict uh, the label y. And the input x can be uh, different data modalities such as vectors, sequences, uh, matrices, and today we'll talk about graphs. And we'll formulate this task as an optimization problem. And the problem looks like this. Our goal is to find a uh, optimal parameter theta such that it can um, minimize the loss function. The loss function will involve labels and uh, predictions. And theta is just a parameter that we want to learn and it could be the weight matrices uh, in a deep neural network. Um, and also in this shallow encoder uh, example, the uh, theta uh, is like a, uh, the entire embedding matrix that we learn over. And we can also define different type of loss function depending on the type of task we care about. For example, for regression tasks, we usually use L2 loss and uh, shown here. And for classification tasks, we also use uh, like a cross entropy loss here. So one useful resource is uh, this uh, link of PyTorch, which give uh, both theoretical and concrete implementation examples of uh, a bunch of useful loss functions for deep learning. So, um, so we suggest you to take a look. Um, and this will also be useful for your uh, collab and potential course project. And another concept will usually pop up in the lecture, and we'll just use the acronym MLP. So uh, MLP is really multi-layer perceptron, and it usually can be written as this. So we have the input x. Uh, the uh, upper uh, L means that uh, we consider the input for the L layer uh, of the network. We will apply a linear transformation for the input, and then uh, plus the bias, which is also trainable. 
we will apply some nonlinear activation function, which could be ReLU or uh, sigmoid, and then uh, we get the output. So this layer is pretty simple, but it's really the building block for tons of useful deep learning architectures. Um, for example, in graph neural network, and also even in other domains like even transformer, we have MLP to do the linear or nonlinear projections, etc. Um, and here's a concrete example. Uh, suppose we have a two-dimensional input to an MLP. Uh, you see there are two neurons here. Uh, we will apply a different uh, intermediate layer in the MLP. Uh, for example, a three-dimensional, uh, like a hidden layer here, and the output will be one dimension. So this is a, like a very frequently used uh, like a module in deep learning architectures. And to summarize, uh, we formulate machine learning as an optimization problem about finding the optimum theta for a deep neural network. And uh, F can be anything, can be a linear layer, MLP, or a complex graph neural network. The way we will uh, train it is through propagate, uh, propagation, where we first uh, forward propagate to make inference, to make predictions, and then we perform back propagate to optimize and find the optimum theta. And we'll use stochastic gradient descent to optimize theta over many iterations. And yeah, that's the uh, basic idea of uh, deep learning. So uh, let's jump into a more exciting topic today that is about deep learning for graphs. How can we uh, define that paradigm, but particularly for graphs or data? So here's our plan or the summary of our content. Uh, we'll have uh, two uh, major steps to define a uh, full deep learning uh, on graph network. We'll first consider the local network structure, uh, where, where we'll describe the aggregation function, which tells us how we summarize information about the local neighborhood of a node. And then we'll define the concrete computational graph to um, execute the uh, computation. And having defined this uh, setup, we'll spec uh, specify a concrete a computable architecture, which involves multiple layers. Uh, and also we'll talk about how do we train this model and how uh, find some examples about unsupervised and supervised learning uh, on this uh, deep graph learning network. So let's begin with uh, the setup. Uh, we assume that we are uh, provided with a graph as the input to this uh, deep graph learning model. Uh, graph can be defined as follow. We have V as the vertex set and A as the adjacency matrix. Uh, we assume adjacent matrix is usually binary. Um, and X is uh, the matrix of no feature. Uh, we have uh, like the cardinality of V, which is number of node times D uh, as the two dimensions. D is the feature dimension of the input. Uh, we represent a small, uh, lowercase v is a node in the uh, node or vertex set. And the neighborhood function of V defines the set of direct neighbors um, of a given node in the graph. Uh, a very useful uh, like a attribute is uh, we have node features associated with nodes. So we don't just plainly have a node in the network. We also associate a lot of meaningful features for a given node. For example, in social network, we can associate a user profile, images of a product, those kind of attributes associated with nodes. And for biological networks, we can use uh, gene expression profile and some uh, gene function information, et cetera, a lot of useful uh, attributes as well. And you can also imagine there are cases where we don't have node feature in the graph data set. Either they are missing or we simply don't know about them. So there are also ways to deal with that kind of uh, failure cases. Uh, in that way, either we can use an indicator vector, for example, one hot encoding of node. So suppose we have a five nodes in the graph, we can have a five dimensional one hot encoding label the nodes as one, two, three, four, five. Um, that way we can get some uh, initialization or initial feature encoding. We can also consider using constant as node feature. Uh, in that case, we'll just use a constant one for all the nodes in the network, just showing that all the nodes are treated equally and they don't really carry uh, too much additional information. So these are the ways, suppose you don't have node feature in the graph data set. So after introducing this, oh, question? Can you go back one slide? Um, so in the case of like vector of constant, how do you decide what the demand should be for the? <laughs> yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, suppose we don't know um, node feature and we want to impute. Um, uh, we want to uh, insert this like a constant vector here. What is the dimension? Uh, 
Um, I think in essentially uh, having a one-dimensional web basic scalar is sufficient here because it really doesn't uh, carry much meaning here. And the only purpose we want to have this uh, feature is that it can be uh, easily processed by a new neural network. And uh, a constant one means that all the nodes are treated equally. So you can imagine you can assign different value to nodes, but that can kind of carry some additional prior information. So let's say, um, like given a network, we can assign A and B with different values. So that basically means you could differentiate these two nodes in the network. So um, this uh, like initialized initialization means how you will like uh, treat or value different nodes in the graph. Uh, question? Uh, so how do we copy edge feature in the training? Yeah, uh, great question. So in this setup, we kind of uh, simplify the case where we do not explain how, uh, edge features. So we say uh, we assume the adjacency matrix is binary, but you can also imagine there are meaningful edge features. For example, um, we have user item interaction graph. User may click an item, they may buy, purchase an item. So there are different edge types. In that case, we can expand the adjacency matrix. So rather than making it to be binary, we can make it like a more meaningful, for example, can be uh, like a categorical value, where different values means different uh, type of edges. So that's one way you can extend to edge attributes. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay. Um, so this is like the setup for graph deep learning, and let's see. Suppose we don't learn, uh, we haven't learned uh, this lecture, and what you may consider to learn from a graph using deep learning. Well, uh, the most uh, straightforward way to consider is because we have an adjacency matrix, we have a node feature matrix, so it will be natural that we can concatenate these two matrices together, and then we can apply the simplest uh, deep learning method, which is MLP, which I just introduced, and we uh, throw this like a concatenated uh, matrix of a graph into an MLP and see how it will predict. So this pattern uh, can be implemented and you, you may work in certain cases, but there are some uh, notable issues. First is that uh, this approach is not really scalable because you can see the input dimension is to the order of number of nodes. And we also have additional uh, feature dimension D. So the, um, like the complexity here is to the order of uh, uh, V times D. And also this is kind of approach is not really applicable to graphs with different sizes because the input dimension will vary based on the number of nodes. So if you train a network on five node graph and you couldn't really apply the same network to a six node graph. So this is also kind of limiting. And finally, that approach is very sensitive to node ordering. So suppose we have the same network, but we re reorder the nodes. So instead of calling it A to E, we may say, say call it E to A. And all the values here will be shuffled as well. And you can see in that case, the output will be different. So these are kind of limitations tell us we couldn't directly define uh, a graph learning method based on the standard deep learning block, rather that uh, we need to define a specific architecture for graph data. data. Uh, another thing we may consider in our toolbox is convolutional neural network, because you see, um, for convolutional network, you can easily process imagery data. And uh, in fact, in all the lecture materials, we visualize a graph as an image. So it will be naturally to see that we can uh, like a pad or like a down sample the graph into the uh, 2D space and then use CNN to process the graph data. And actually in the early days in deep learning, researchers have done that. Um, and it actually works in some cases, for example, molecular classification, those kind of uh, tasks where uh, graphs are relatively simple. But um, our, uh, the issue is uh, the network doesn't have the regular structure as images. So you can see that network could be very complex in its structure, and most notably, it doesn't have the fixed notion of locality in this case. So what I mean is that, for example, here you may think um, these two nodes are close together, or these two nodes are close together, but in reality, maybe the nodes that are far away they are also very close together with the node here because they are connected. So you have tons of options about how to visualize a network into an image. So that gives you a lot of freedom, but also uh, prevent a model to meaningfully learn from network. Uh, 
And also, um, graph is permutation invariant because graph is an unordered object. So, um, so even though you have this, uh, like a convolutional filter uh, patched here, you may arbitrarily shuffle the order of the node, and the meaning doesn't change, but the CNN network will treat it differently. So this is kind of a, like a thought experiment that shows why we couldn't directly apply CNN on graphs. So let's discuss what are the properties we really need for deep learning methods for graph. Let's start with the first property that is so-called permutation invariance. The idea of permutation invariance is that uh, we know that graph does not have a canonical ordering and we can have arbitrary order plans for a given network. Here's a uh, concrete example. Uh, we can have uh, this network as a running example. We define a specific node ordering uh, here and we can define the corresponding node features and the adjacency matrix basically describe how this graph uh, looks like. And in the pin time, we can shuffle the order of the node here. So we can come with a second way to order the graph. And you see that after this shuffling or permutation, the node feature matrix and the adjacency matrix, they get different. And our idea is that because we know these two order plans describe the same network, what we wish to say is that the graph and node representations for these two order plans, but for the same network, they should be same. They should be identical. So this is kind of our goal when we want to define a deep learning method for graphs. So let's uh, describe this permutation in variance property more rigorously. So what do we mean by um, like a, the graph representation uh, are the same? So we can define like a projection function or embedding function f that takes the adjacency matrix A and the uh, node feature matrix X. And what we say is that we can have two different order plan for the network, A1, X1, and A2, X2. And suppose we uh, take this input to the same encoding function F, we want the output to be the same. So that basically says, uh, suppose we have two uh, ordering of the same network, we want a encoding function F, which is say a graph neural network, should always generate the same representation for the same graph. This is like a visually say, like a, the two order plans, the output F should be the same. And we also formally uh, define it uh, like a, uh, here, that uh, like a, basically uh, for permutation invariance, we not only for two, two ordering, like order plan A and order plan B, we should consider any potential like a uh, order plan I and J. And we formally say that suppose it's a permutation invariant, then for any pair of I and J, the output uh, should be the same. We can also uh, re view this as in the uh, matrix form. So we define a graph function that essentially map a uh, node feature matrix R uh, into the order of a uh, uh, V times M and the adjacency matrix to a vector space. And we say this uh, function F is permission invariant. Uh, if we wrote in the matrix form A and X as the input and would permute the adjacency matrix and permute um, the uh, feature matrix and the output are the same for any permutation P, then we say um, this function is permutation invariant. So the same thing we can express it in different ways, but this is a kind of definition of uh, permutation invariance. Another concept here is uh, permutation equivariance. So here is a different term uh, with uh, invariance. We talk about the uh, idea of equivariance. So what does it mean? Um, we talk about uh, we can encode a graph into a graph representation where we have one vector for the graph. Now we are considering the representation in the node level. So instead of having one vector, we will have one vector for each node in the graph. And in the end, we will have an uh, embedding or output matrix for the network. So now the output, instead of being a vector, it will be a matrix. So what is the nice property we wish to see here? Well, um, we've got the same network and we permute uh, the order of the nodes. Therefore, we would like to see that the values or the encoded values for different nodes, they should be the same, but uh, the order should be according to the position of the node in the network. Here is a uh, illustrative example. Um, so let's say, let's say we care about this yellow node. Uh, 
And in the first order plan, the yellow node is labeled as A, and it appeared here. And our hope is that because we only shuffle the order of the node, so the encoding of the yellow node should be the same. And it should appear in the, the latest encoding of the second order plan, E. So it says that the encoding for node should stay the same, and it's only based on how the node is labeled. It should be always associated with the node label A and node label E. And the same is for all the other nodes in the network. And let's see another example. For example, for the green node, is, uh, here it is labeled as C, and here it is labeled as D. And suppose we have this nice equivariance property, then after we shuffle the node ordering, the value should stay the same, and it is closely tied to the label of the node. We can also formally define what is permission equivariant. That basically says, um, if the output vector of a node at the same position in the graph remain unchanged for any permutation, and we say this function is permutation equivariant. And we can also see this in the uh, matrix form. So now we define, instead of a graph function, we define a node function that encode a network into a matrix instead of the single vector. And this matrix uh, is permutation uh, equivariant, uh, sorry, this function is permutation equivariant if uh, we permute input, uh, input uh, of adjacent matrix, of node feature matrix, and the output matrix is also permuted accordingly with the permutation uh, matrix P. In that case, we say this function is permutation equivalence. So we talk about these two properties. It would be nice to review them and compare these two properties. So here I show the definition, uh, the matrix definition of uh, invariant and equivariant. Um, in plain language, what does it really mean is that, um, so suppose we permute the input, then the output will always uh, stay the same. This is for permutation invariant. And the output here is usually a vector. So we assign one vector for one graph. And we can also define a plain language definition for equivariant, where we, if we permute the input, the output will also get permuted uh, sorry, accordingly. And in that case, this is um, usually considered a case where we map a graph into a matrix, and the matrix talk about the embedding uh, vector for each of the node. And here are three concrete examples of what functions are invariant and what functions are equivariant. The first example is this like a one vector transpose time x. It's basically a summation over a matrix over different rows. And in that case, you can easily see the function is permanent invariant because it is summation. So no matter how you permute the input x, uh, the output will stay the same. Uh, here's another example, which is permanent equivalent, which is pretty simple. So we just uh, output, always output the node um, input uh, x. This is uh, basically the uh, shallow encoder that we see, right? We have an encoder matrix that essentially is the output. In, and it's easy to see it's equivalent because if you permute the input, of course the output get permuted uh, equivalently. And finally, we have example of this A times X as a permutation equivalent function. And here we use the property of that, uh, suppose you transpose a matrix and then transpose it with its, um, and then times with its transpose, you'll cancel out into an identity function. And uh, you see this function is also permutation equivalent. And this idea of A times X is uh, like a simplest version of a graph learning or a graph message aggregation. And we'll talk about this later as well. So uh, any questions here? I know the concept are a bit dense here. What is P exactly? Yeah, so we have a... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, we didn't have a visual license here, uh, but it's really like a binary uh, matrix. It has zero, has ones, and um, it basically said how we shuffle different columns of a network, uh, of a matrix, sorry. Um, right, let's see. Um, suppose um, uh, we have a, a matrix of six rows, then the permutation matrix will also be six by six and uh, different locations of one and zero says how, where we should put uh, the A, uh, input A to the output. So let's say if we have um, uh, like a zero, one, uh, one, zero, then that means we'll shuffle A and B. Uh, 
So like this is the idea of permutation uh, matrix, and you can also search on the web for more. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, um, we can uh, continue. So why do we want to study these two properties, uh, invariance and equivariance? That is because uh, these properties are pretty important and essentially the key building blocks for graph learning method. So uh, I show an example of graph learning method here, and you can see that it usually involves multiple permutation equivariant layers and permutation invariant layers. And this is kind of how we make sure uh, graph deep learning method can uh, faithfully represent the graph rather than like a mess it up like a, an MLP that we uh, like uh, introduced earlier. And, and here's like a, a visual example like why MLP doesn't satisfy this property. So suppose we have an MLP and then we have this vector uh, as input and we permute the values of this vector, um, you see, and after throwing it into an MLP, then uh, it's clear that the output will be different because it doesn't really have the, um, the way to, say, aggregate it uh, in a permutation invariant way, so the output will always be different. And this is precisely why this naive MLP approach to try to encode a network would fail, um, because it doesn't have this nice property of permutation invariant. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about how do we specifically define a graph neural network with these two properties. And in particular, we'll talk about uh, passing and um, message, uh, message information on the neighbors. Uh, question? Sorry, you know the previous slide? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it feels like this is a problem that would come up for like kind of a neural network for any kind of unstructured data, right? Where like ordering is not important. So, like, is graph neural networks the first time it came up, or like was it seen before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, the question is about like a can we use the graph learning method to uh, encode other unordered objects and where this ob ob uh, idea originated from? Um, and yeah, I think uh, the idea of graph learning methods, as we also dive into detail later, uh, is inspired from a learning from a set. So essentially, uh, a neighbor, uh, the set of neighbors of a given node is uh, a set. And suppose we have a method to learn from set, essentially we can uh, build like a complete graph learning method. So it definitely also have roots in other areas of uh, deep learning. Okay, um, uh, let's continue with our discussion. So, so far we have talked about the motivation of graph deep learning and the, uh, the required properties that we wish to see in the graph deep learning method. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about a concrete example uh, that is so-called graph convolutional networks. And this is arguably the most popular uh, way to encode a graph and the most popular uh, way to implement a graph neural network. So here's the idea of a graph convolutional neural network. Uh, our idea is to encode a node based on its neighborhood structure. And we follow a two-step process. Suppose we want to encode a node i in the network. We will first define its uh, computational graph based on the node's local neighborhood structure. So we will define it based on its one-hop neighbors and the neighbors of neighbors and so on. Suppose we have multiple layers. And then having defined this computational graph, we will propagate and transform information based on the defined computational graph. And the key concept here is that how we can learn and propagate information across the network uh, defined by the node uh, neighborhood structure. So we will uh, introduce the idea through a running example. This is an input graph. And our goal is to encode this yellow node A. Based on the idea I just described, we will enroll the computational graph by uh, finding the A's direct neighbors in the network, uh, B, C, uh, and D. And then we'll iteratively enroll the neighbor structure for each of its neighbor. So for node B, we will see its neighbors A and C. For node C, we see its uh, neighbors and so on. So you can imagine this enrolling can happen iteratively until um, you reach the number of rounds you wish to see. That is the number of layers in the network. And another thing to note that uh, a node can appear multiple times in this computational graph. What do I mean? That you can see node A, it will also appear uh, here, like an A uh, three times. The, the interpretation here is that node A is a two-hop neighbor of itself. 
So if you look two hop away for a given node, you will encounter the node itself again. So uh, it is allowed that we can have this duplicate value in the computational graph. So uh, having defined the architecture of the computation, how do we really implement? We have these uh, different gray boxes, which are essentially a neural network. What does this neural network do is to compress or condense the information about a set of different uh, nodes, uh, and then we'll generate the uh, new representation and then compress it again. So this is uh, like a, what where neural network will help for a graph learning method for in uh, GN. And we can repeat this process and define the computation graph for each node in the network. So we'll talk about this yellow node, but you see we can define the computation graph for each node in the graph. And um, the intuition here is that different nodes will have a different computation graph because their local neighborhood structure are different. And this is precisely how uh, graph learning methods can differentiate nodes uh, in the network because uh, they have a different neighborhood structure, we will define different computational graph, and therefore the embedding we generate for different nodes are, are also different. Um, question? Is it true the statement that, let's say for a given, for a problem of, um, of node embedding, mm -hmm. um, that the, the higher the degree is, the more complicated the embedding would be, meaning that like nodes that are not, that don't have a lot of neighbors are, easy, are more easily to, to embed, because we see here, the embedding basically scales with the neighbors, right? So if there's one neighbor, it's an easy embedding. If we have a thousand neighbors, it's like to embed all that information from one node is a lot. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, I think your question is how about like a, is like a node with fewer neighbors easier to encode? Um, uh, well, I think rigorously, we need to define what does easy mean, but I think intuitively, um, like a, a, a node with fewer neighbors, uh, it takes uh, like a fewer information and it will be uh, more easily to be compressed. And there is actually a frontier of uh, GN that uh, describes this problem called a so-called over-scratching problem because you can see that uh, for GN, it's always a talk about how to scratch information uh, together. And uh, like uh, that uh, problem definitely basically said, suppose a network is very deep and the degree of a node is very high, like uh, the network may tend to over scratch uh, like uh, this information of a network. And your intuition here is uh, correct in the sense that if the node has fewer neighbor, then it's uh, easier to uh, uh, get the embedding. Um, okay, um, let's continue. And another concept here is the number of layers. Uh, in my example here, um, we have a two-layer uh, graph neural network, which basically said uh, we look at the neighbors and then the neighbors of neighbors. And this concept uh, is quite important for GN because the number of layer of uh, GN really tells about how far away we look in the network. So given a two-layer GN, we will usually be able to see uh, like the nodes that are two hops away. So this is kind of different with other deep learning architecture, say in uh, convolutional neural network, uh, the number of layers is usually just a hyperparameter, right? You can pick uh, whenever uh, like a, the model is performing the best. But for GN, it has a concrete physical meaning. The number of GN layers tells us how far away you can see in the network. And usually uh, we will pick the number of layer approximately equal to the diameter of the graph. So in this graph, we have diameter two, which means that uh, two nodes can at most have like a, uh, the distance of two for any pair of nodes in the network. So in this case, usually having a two layer uh, GN will be sufficient for the network to pick up the essential information in the network. So uh, setting the, um, like we can have a, this kind of a more principled way to set number of layers for a graph neural network. And uh, we also have the concept of neighborhood aggregation, which is uh, done by this uh, gray brackets uh, in the uh, example here. So the question is, uh, how do we really define these boxes? The uh, most simple approach is to take an average of the information. Um, uh, to be more specific, we can first average the message that we compute for each neighbor of a given node, and then we'll apply a, a neural network that further transform this uh, aggregate or average information. And this two-step process is essentially what uh, we will later see in a graph convolutional network. Uh, 
Um, so here is like the mass mathematical. Uh, there's a question. Yeah, can you go back one slide? Uh, yeah, sorry, here is good. So if you said, for example, you will end up choosing, let's say, K2 the neighborhood, so two convolutional uh, um, layers. But we see all the nodes, basically, if we go two hops away, we'll end up having all the other nodes as, as a part of their embedding process, as inputs. So don't all the nodes end up having this like very similar representations when after after two K? Yeah, hops? yeah. Yeah, I think you asked a lot of insightful questions. Uh, the question is, um, suppose uh, we enroll the network and we look at the computation graph for each of the nodes. Uh, wouldn't, in the end, all the nodes look uh, similar? So we talk about this over-squashing problem for GN. Another research uh, idea here is a so-called over-smoothing problem, uh, which is precisely what we described. So suppose we enroll this process uh, continuously for multiple layers, and in the end, uh, all the nodes, they have very similar neighborhood structure, and which mean, makes them indistinguishable. So they all landed with the same embedding. So it, this is also like a research question, but usually the way we can get rid of this over-smoothing problem is to do not like uh, set very deep GN. Like we just set a number of layers uh, equal or approximate the diameter of the network. And in that case, like uh, in the example we show here, usually the computational graph of different nodes are largely the same. But suppose you continuously enroll, enroll um, multiple layers, um, you may face the issue that all the nodes may look this, almost the same and we couldn't differentiate. So, this is kind of different with like convolutional neural net or rest net where you can enroll, I don't know, 150 layers. For graph, if you enroll 100 layers, then essentially the model will learn nothing because it can't differentiate any nodes. Okay, so we have a lot of visualizations. Now we can get some concrete mathematical definition of what exactly is a graph convolutional network. So our input is node attributes, um, x, v. So this, that describes a specific uh, feature of, of a given node. Um, and by the way, to uh, make this computation more concrete, we consider a case of embedding a single node, v. So you see all the um, expression here, we have this uh, subscript uh, v. And the output is this z, v. So we have a node attribute, and we want to generate embedding z for this given node, v. So how do we uh, start this computation? We will assign this xv uh, to the uh, hv0, which is basically the zeroth layer or uh, like the initialization for the uh, input of a graph neural network. And then we'll repeatedly uh, apply this transformation. So what this transformation does is it will first take the embedding of v at the previous layer k, and then we also take the average of the neighbor's uh, previous layer embedding. So in this uh, transformation, we do two things. We consider how do we represent the node itself in the previous layer. And after we get the embedding, we'll apply a linear transformation to uh, encode or transform that message. The second question we ask is how do we represent the neighbors of a given node? And in that case, we'll first take the average and we'll normalize uh, by the, like, a uh, the neighborhood size or the degree of the node. And after we take the average, we then apply another transformation, uh, W, that tells us uh, how to transform and further encode the neighbor's information. So the layer is usually just, uh, is essentially just two parts. How do we encode the node itself? And how do we encode the node's neighbors? Uh, and after having this encoding, because it's a fully linear function, if you stack linear function again and again, it's still linear. We have to have, uh, insert some nonlinearity here. The most popular choice is uh, ReLU, which is also uh, popular in other deep learning architecture. So this basically defines how we compute one layer of GNN. And in practice, we'll have multiple layers uh, where k describes the number of total layers. So we'll iteratively apply this GNN on the input or the zeroth layer of um, graph embedding. And then in the end, we'll get the embedding after k runs computation. And this is, uh, uh, can be expressed as uh, doing k runs of neighborhood aggregation. And notice that here, this, because we use a summation 
um, this function is uh, permutation invariant. So this uh, follows the nice property that we follow uh, that we discussed uh, for any graph learning method. Um, any question here? Why why did you use uh, average of neighbors previous layer embeddings versus the, just the neighbors of raw features like like or like the embedding of the neighbor at layer zero? Um, so the question is uh, why don't we average the input feature instead of Neighbor's previous layer embeddings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering why would you, wouldn't you choose um, the layer zero embedding of the neighbor? Um, yeah. I see. So uh, you're suggesting that instead of uh, just look at the previous layer embedding, we can also look at the zeros layer, the initialization embedding. Yeah, because to me it sounds like um, you're adding this node at this step, so it doesn't quite make sense to um, like look at all the previous case step of that node. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so first the motivation here is that we want to have so-called deep representation or like an interleaved uh, complex representation for a node. So that's why we have to like iteratively like a generate embedding and then feed it into the next layer. So suppose here we replace uh, this representation with um, the zeros layer, then the uh, embedding is so-called shallow because you never go beyond like a one layer network. You directly transform the input um, zeros layer. Um, but I think uh, your idea is actually uh, in, uh, like a helpful worth seeing in some of the literature. Uh, where um, probably um, some of you know the uh, notion of dense net. So essentially your suggestion is that uh, during computation, we always associate computation with the raw input uh, zeros layer. And you can consider in the network um, representation, we have a stack of multiple layers, but then uh, in, the, in each layer we'll connect it back uh, to the input. And I think that's kind of one interpretation of your suggestion. Um, I think, yeah, it's kind of also valuable, uh, but in this basic version of GN, we just, uh, just use the previous layer. Um, any other questions? Okay, so yeah, basically this is the most dense slide uh, in this lecture uh, that des describe what is a GCN looks like. So we talk about uh, permutation equivalence and permutation invariance, and let's uh, see or uh, like check whether the network we have defined follows these two properties. So let's first talk about a permutation invariance property. So uh, the argument is as follows. So given a node in the network, the GCN that computes its embedding is permutation invariant. Um, our example uh, is to embed this uh, blue node. And we say uh, this computation for a given node embedding is permutation invariant because two reasons. First, we make sure that we share the neural network weights when we transform the neighbors of, of a given node. And second, when we take this aggregation, we make sure that the aggregation is permutation invariant, for example, just a summation. And due to these two reasons, we, we can conclude that this uh, full computation, computational graph is also permutation invariant. So why this property is uh, like a, interesting or like non-trivial? That's because um, we can also consider define the def, uh, computation differently. And in fact, in the in early like literature of GNN, people have tried uh, other ways of performing the aggregation of neighbors. And they may perform well, but they don't really uh, like follow the permutation invariant property. So an, another popular choice in, at that time was to use a recurrent neural network to encode a set of nodes. So in that case, suppose we have neighbors B, C, D, they will uh, throw B, C, D as a sequence and throw it into a recurrent neural net and use the output as the like, encoded value. And although this uh, idea like, makes sense, it doesn't really follow this permutation invariant property. Um, and uh, in our case, we can use this uh, shared neural net race uh, plus uh, like a sum aggregation to make sure the computation is permutation invariant. Uh, another property to check is permutation equivalence. And our argument is as follows. Um, consider when we try to encode all the nodes in the network. So we not just uh, 
Previously, we focused on uh, encoding one node, say this blue node. Now, suppose we want to consider the uh, embedding function for all the nodes in the network. We claim that this uh, embedding function is permutation equivalent. And just to remind you what does equivalent mean, is that suppose we have this same network, but with two different ordering plan, and we can check. Um, suppose we, after the permutation, um, the same node will have the same encoded value, but only their position will uh, differ, differ accordingly. Uh, so what is the reasoning why this is true for GNN? This is uh, because two reasons. First is that we make sure the feature matrix and the embedding are closely aligned. What do I mean is that here we always make sure the first row is talking about node A in the, both the input node feature and the output node embedding. And the second row is about node B and, uh, and third row is node C, et cetera. And the second reason is that we showed that given a node, when we apply a GNN, it is permutation invariant. So after permuting the node, the color, which represents the value of the embedding, is always uh, the same because of this invariant property. So given these two reasons, suppose we shuffle the order of all the nodes in the network, we can see globally it uh, presents this permutation equivalent property. So uh, why does this property also important? That is because um, in our case, we want to encode all the nodes in the network. And we will ha want to have a reliable way to extract the embedding for a given node. Suppose we uh, compute embeddings in parallel. What could be the failure mode is that we may correctly embed each node. So A to F, we get their embeddings, but we may get a, like a wrong order of the embedding. So instead of having them access aligned, so the first row node A, second row node B, we may get them like a wrong, like for them the third row may talk about node A. So even though we get globally um, the set of embeddings correct, their, their ordering may be wrong. So the property of perpendicular equivalent ensures that we always can uh, reliably get the embedding for a given node. So this, uh, in, this property is also non-trivial and really important for GNN. Okay, uh, we can move forward. So, so far we have defined the mo model of uh, graph neural network. And next, I'm going to talk about how do we train such a network. So uh, to train a network, uh, really the key is to define a loss function and based on the embedding Z that we get. So uh, what are uh, our uh, like a training uh, pipeline or training procedure looks like? Uh, this is the same definition of GCN that we have just seen. We have two main uh, trainable parameters here, uh, W and B, uh, where we talk about, to understand this equation, we talk about how to encode the node itself and how to encode the node's neighbors. So node B tells how do we transform and process the information of the node itself, and node, uh, this uh, matrix W talks about how to encode the neighbors of a, a given node. Um, so these are the trainable parameter, and then we can feed the output uh, of the node embedding into any loss function that you can see. So in the beginning of review, we talk about uh, L2 loss for regression and cross entropy loss for classification. So you can define those uh, loss function uh, based on the computed node embedding. And another, um, uh, sorry, question. Yeah, can you go back one slide, please? No, not this one, sorry. Is it back, this is forward. Uh, yeah. Another one? Wait. Oh, you mean the previous the one? Slide? where there's like the embedding on the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here we go. Okay. So in, let's say if this is a classification case and we have these two representation of the, of the network and it's the same network in the end of the day. How do we make sure that embedding H1 and embedding H2 end up with the same output, let's say, that it's whatever, class A. So we just like stack, stack them up then as one vector, just, and then do some kind of uh, summation, and then that's it? Or how, how, do we, how do we go from these embeddings to a uh, to, uh, specification? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually uh, in the following slide we will talk about that. But the idea is that um, for a given node we get a vector, right? We can 
have a, for example, an additional layer that projects this vector into a single score, the score can tell that the predicted class of that uh, like a node. For example, it's a binary classification, we have true or false. Then we can project this two-dimensional vector into a single scalar uh, from range of zero to one, and that can tell us uh, how we want to classify this given node. But that itself should also be like a summation or something where the order doesn't matter, right? Because we want h1 and h2 to have the same numerical value when, you, when we go for that function. Oh, yeah, so I think uh, here uh, I want to clarify. Um, because we want to define a node classification problem, so the label uh, are not directly associated with the uh, embedding matrix, but uh, associated with a particular node. So for example, we know node C, uh, sorry, we know this blue node is associated with like a, uh, like a label of one. So it's not uh, related to the order of the node, but we always find this blue node and then assign a, order, uh, a label of one to the node. And this way we can um, always reliably associate a node with label and then train the network regardless of how we order the different nodes. Okay. Um, any other question? Okay, so uh, we talk about uh, training a graph neural network, and then uh, the goal is to optimize these weight matrices uh, based on the uh, embedding. And another uh, important topic uh, here is how can we uh, efficiently uh, train or optimize this uh, uh, GM? The reason that uh, the success of modern deep learning is really rely on parallel computing, uh, GPU acceleration. So uh, earlier our formulation was like a local level. So we only consider how to compute embedding for a given node, but we didn't really talk about how to parallelize like, that algorithm. So now our goal is to rewrite the definition of GN, but now in the matrix form. And it's suppose we can read, read in, in a matrix form, then we can easily utilize those uh, parallel computing device to accelerate the training process. So here is our uh, idea. So uh, earlier we talked about uh, the core of no neighborhood aggregation is about summing the neighbors of a given node. And we can equivalently written it, uh, write it into a matrix form, which is essentially A times H, where A is the adjacency matrix, but we particularly look at the row that describe node V, and then H is the uh, matrix that describe the embedding for all the nodes in the network. And another notion is the uh, D, which is a diagonal matrix that tells about um, the degree of each node in the network. Uh, we can use the inverse of D uh, to express like the inverse of the node degree. And based on these two uh, matrix that we define, we can write this aggregation function, which tells us we want to um, take the average of each node's uh, neighbors into its matrix form, where we have this uh, D inverse times A times H. So you can check that these two equations are the same, and this way we can express this local wheel of GN into this uh, global matrix wheel. So follow this uh, idea, we can additionally um, write the entire transformation of GNN into its matrix form. So now we have this um, A times H times W and H times B, which uh, basically describe how we transform the node's neighbors and transform the node itself in a global wheel. Um, and so the red one talks about how to aggregate the neighbors, the blue term talks about how to transform the node itself. And in practice, this implies that we can efficiently compute GNN not in a local perspective, but really in the global sparse matrix multiplication perspective. And this can be uh, like a very helpful because suppose we can accelerate uh, sparse matrix multiplication. Essentially, you can uh, accelerate any graph learning algorithm. And uh, there's a side node like a, that is kind of a contract with, with, with the other set. That is, uh, not every GNN can be written in this matrix form. So uh, because the aggregation function can be more complex. So what are some uh, examples? Um, so for example, when we perform the aggregation, instead of, instead of taking the average of the neighbors, we can consider taking the maximum of the neighbors. Because this maximum operator cannot be written in this matrix form, we cannot really uh, succinctly write it in the, this uh, matrix uh, expression and couldn't really benefit from this uh, uh, sparse matrix multiplication.
Okay, so we talk about how to uh, efficiently train a network. Uh, next, I'm going to give some concrete example of uh, like how to train it under the concrete machine learning setting. Uh, as you probably know, there are two um, major paradigm of machine learning, that is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we have a concrete label associated with a graph. And let's say, for example, we have a node label for each node. And then we can define a loss function based on the type of classification or regression. And alternatively, we can consider the unsupervised learning paradigm for graphs, where in this case, we don't have any particular external label for a node. But uh, instead, we can use the graph structure itself as the supervision. So um, here is like an example of an unsurprised learning uh, technique. And this idea is actually very related to what we learned in the previous lecture about random work embedding. So in this case, the loss function will take two node embedding as input. So embedding for node u and node v. We will have a decoder function, which is, an, for example, an inner product. And then we'll compare this prediction with a node label y, u, v. So how do we label the a pair of node u, v? The idea is that we can label it based on node similarity. So suppose a pair of node is similar, considered similar, then we label them as one. And if it's not, we label them as zero. And how do we define the similarity? It can be precisely what we uh, teach uh, in the previous lecture. For example, in random work, suppose two nodes co-occur in a random work, then we assign a label one to this pair of nodes. And uh, like if it's not, then we assign zero. We can also use the idea of matrix factorization. We also mentioned in the previous lecture. And in that case, uh, we aim to reconstruct the network structure. So suppose two nodes, they are direct neighbors of each other. We can label them as one. And if not, we can uh, label as zero. We can additionally use a node proximity in the graph. For example, if two nodes are two hop neighbors in the network, we can label them as two. Uh, three half neighbor as three. So there are a lot of like a creative way that you can define these um, um, labels and then use them as self supervised learning uh, objectives for graphs. Um, an alternatively term for this uh, idea is uh, so-called self supervised learning. So we want to use the graph structure itself to create a supervision for a network. And self supervised learning also have a lot of other use cases in the uh, deep learning application. But in, a, in graph, it will be pretty exciting because you can define uh, very complex and very interesting objectives on graphs. So this is the idea of how we can do n learning on graph if you don't have any labels. OK. So uh, here's a, like, a visualization for um, a concrete supervised learning example. Um, so uh, in this case, um, suppose we have a drug-drug interaction network. And we want to classify uh, a given node, whether it's toxic or not. And we get a particular uh, label for that node. Then what we can do is that we can get the embedding of that node, ZV, and throw it into this um, loss function. And this loss function is really a binary cross entropy loss that are widely used for classification. And so here, ZV is the encoder output from a graph neural network. And we have some classification weights to uh, weight this like a, a final layer embedding into a scalar. And then we can optimize based on this uh, uh, binary cross, uh, cross entropy loss. And this uh, loss function, what is really saying that because we want to uh, minimize the loss, it said like a, there's an inverse here. Uh, we are essentially maximize the value here. And suppose this y, which is the ground truth node class label, Suppose it takes value of one, then the second term get canceled out. So our idea is we want, to, we want to maximize the predictive value. So suppose the class label is one, then we want to maximize the prediction. And uh, alternatively, if the class label is zero, the first term disappear, and we only have the second term here. And we want to have this value as low as possible to make sure this uh, entire expression uh, is maximized. So suppose the class label is zero, then we want to minimize the prediction. So this is like the intuition of the loss function. So we have already talked about um, uh, basically everything about uh, uh, GN. So here's like a end-to-end uh, -end like a 
a description of how the full pipeline may work. We have this network and we want to embed a node A. We will define the neighborhood structure uh, of node A into a computational graph and we will be able to uh, generate its node embedding and we can then define the loss function that we just uh, go went over uh, based on the predicted embedding. And we will train that loss function over a set of input nodes. For example, we may consider train on node ABC in this network. And after the training, uh, we can do prediction or inference for uh, nodes in the graph. And it is worth noticing that we can make predictions even for nodes that we never trained on. So we train on the node ABC, but DEF will never show it to the model during training. But still, we can use the train network to make predictions for these uh, three unseen nodes. And this property is so-called the inductive learning capability. Inductive learning is really about uh, can we uh, use a train network and generalize it to unseen uh, nodes. And the reason that uh, a GN can perform inductive learning is because we share the parameter in the computational graph. And because the parameters are shared, we are not bounded by how the input uh, nodes look like. So we can use the same network but repurpose it to any um, unseen structure in the network. So um, here are some examples how we can utilize this inductive learning capability. Um, we can consider train the neural network in one graph, but then apply it to a new graph. And this new graph is never seen during training time. And what are some use cases? Uh, for example, uh, we can define a graph over protein interaction of different organisms. We can train the network in one organism that we have a precise training label, but given we have a trained model, we can generate embeddings for an unseen organism. And this is quite useful, say, in a biological domain. Uh, another example is that we can use this property to uh, predict over new nodes. In this case, we have a, a given graph or a snapshot of a graph. And over time, we will get new nodes arrive into the network. And our goal is to generate embedding for the new node. Um, the example use case here is very popular in industry. Uh, where essentially you can represent a lot of online networks into a graph, uh, such as Reddit, uh, YouTube, et cetera. So suppose uh, uh, someone uploads a new video into the YouTube network. Um, this is essentially uh, where we, a new node arrives in the network. We can use a pre-trained uh, graph neural network and generate embedding for this new node. So this is fully relying on the fact that the GNN is inductive. Um, on the contrary, suppose we use the uh, thing we learned on the uh, previous lecture, say no to back, it will be hard because we wouldn't be able to generate an embedding directly for a new node, but rather we have to perform a few iterations of optimization until we can uh, generate embedding for a new node. So this is the a nice property of a GN. Uh, question? Yeah, I was wondering if there's like any results on like if you're successively adding new nodes to like a pre-trained graph or like a, a graph that you pre-trained on, then is there a point after you just start to deteriorate in terms of like the uh, accuracy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, yeah, this is also like a frontier in the research. The question is about like, a, suppose we continuously add new nodes into the network. Uh, of course, until certain point, we, the model wouldn't be able to predict. And how do we find that point? Um, yeah, I, I think this is like a, a pretty nice research question to ask. Um, I think usually people just consider it in practice. Uh, what people do in practice is that they have um, like an ongoing validation set. So over time, um, they will uh, re-evaluate the network on a holdout validation set. Suppose the performance on the validation set gets deteriorated, then uh, uh, it basically says the model is kind of failing to learn over a new graph structure. And that is time when you want to retrain or fine tune the network to the uh, architecture, uh, to, the, to the new graph. Uh, question. Even we only have like, um, for example, on YouTube, on YouTube we, we only have like one graph, so how can it be the new training set and validation set? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually will talk about specific layout of uh, graph learning method in the next lecture, uh, so stay tuned. But in the meantime, I can quickly say, uh, usually we'll just do the random splitting. Uh, for example, given this network, 
we may randomly pick some of the nodes as the training node and some of them as the validation node. And we'll make sure during training we never see this like a holdout node. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, the basic idea. But there are a lot of different variants and we'll cover in the next lecture. Um, question? When you add a new node to the network, do you need to know all its connections to the existing network? Or can you sort of like add a new node and then predict where it should be connected in that network? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the question is that um, can we also predict how the new node will connect to the existing node? Um, and actually, uh, there's a, a bit late in our course, we have a course called, uh, lecture about deep generative model. And that is precisely the problem uh, you talk about, where we want to predict how a node can connect with each uh, existing node. And this way, we can use it to generate a graph. So we, we know how a new node connect, and we can iteratively do this to generate a full network. And yeah, that's kind of a, a definitely doable. Uh, alternatively, you can think of this a link prediction task. So you want to predict the missing link between a new node and existing graph. So yeah, that's a nice uh, application. Yeah. Um, okay, um, we can move forward to the last part of the lecture. So far we talk about the basis of uh, deep learning on graphs and particular architecture of GCN. And in the final part of this lecture, I want to discuss the relationship between G and CN because I think uh, a lot of you are already familiar with convolutional neural network for images, and we want to compare and argue that uh, actually GN is more general than CN, and it subsumes, uh, subsumes the CNs. So uh, how do we compare GN and CNs? Well, uh, this is how CN works, right? We have an image, we can have define a convolutional kernel, and we'll um, move that kernel around in the input image to generate the output feature map. Uh, usually we wouldn't we'll write it in a, like a convolutional form, but now because we just learned this idea of aggregation, aggregation over neighbors, we can equivalently write CNN into the language that we just talked about, about how do we aggregate neighbors. So we can define neighbors in the image based on the uh, proximity of pixels. So for example, given a node uh, and this three by three uh, image patch, uh, we can define um, the eight neighbors of a given pixel um, as, uh, as its uh, neighbors. And also we want to not include the node itself. Um, and then having defined this neighborhood, we can uh, define the transformation W over each of the uh, input pixel. And then we take the summation and do the nonlinear uh, transformation. And this is essentially an alternative way to express a CNN. And another way to encode an imagery data is that we simply convert this grid-like structure into a graph. And this graph can look at this. So we have a node in the center. We have the self edge that connect node with itself. And then we can connect all the neighboring pixels with it. So essentially now a node has nine neighbors. And we can write, uh, we can define a GNN over a graph defined like this. So we reuse the, um, the expression uh, about a GCN definition like this. And uh, we can compare what we have with GNN and CNN. CNN, we, uh, we just derive it in the previous slide. We find that these two expressions are almost uh, identical. The only difference is that there's a, a like upper script uh, U here, uh, there is not. That basically says for GN, we'll share the parameter across all the neighbors because we have this permutation invariant property. But for CN, we do not have that like a risk constraint of permutation invariant. The reason is that we know the uh, property of location in an image. And we also want to explicit it, uh, explicit, express it in the network definition. More precisely, in an image data set, we, have, uh, we are aware of the relative position of pixels. For example, we can label the, each neighboring pixel of a given node, given pixel, as this uh, negative one, negative, uh, negative one, negative one, negative one, zero, et cetera. We have their uh, relative location. And this way, we don't have to consider the permutation environment property because we have this very explicit ordering. So this way, we can define a unique weight for each position of the neighbors. Whereas in graph, because we don't have 
this, uh, like a prior information of the location of nodes, we have to treat them equally. So we define this uh, permutation invariant function which share the weights. That's actually the only difference between uh, G and CN in terms of this uh, grid-like data. So here's a summary of uh, further discussing the difference. Um, in terms of uh, co comparing uh, CN and GN, uh, first for uh, uh, GN, like uh, the size of the filter is uh, pretty fine for CN, but for GN it's not pretty fine. Uh, and also we talk about um, uh, GN can process arbitrary graph with different degrees for each node. Um, and uh, CN is not permutation invariant as we just talked about because we know the exact position of different nodes. But uh, GNs, we do, do not have such information, so we have this permutation invariant function of aggregating neighbors. So that's uh, everything uh, we have in this lecture. Uh, to summarize, we talk about the basics of a neural network, and we motivate the idea of deep uh, learning for graphs, and what are the ideal properties we want to have uh, in a graph learning method. And then we particularly talk about one uh, architecture called graph convolutional network, how do we define it into a, uh, like a uh, aggregation of neighbors, and how do we train it? And finally, we'll talk about how we compare genes with genes. Um, that's it for the course, and um, I hope you enjoyed it.